like to welcome you back to our study, Being Pillars in the Temple of God. We're going to continue with our study today as we're looking through the things that we need to understand to be able to build up our lives uh, in a sense, uh, comparing and looking at uh, the engineering feat that the Japanese had with the Shinbashira temples that they created and uh, how they made them so that they're actually uh, for the most part earthquake resistant and we're going to look at a couple other examples of designs that were made earthquake resistant in our study today but more than anything what we want to look at today is how we can build what are the pieces that we need inside of our own construction so that we can have a solid uh, a solid life a solid spiritual life that can resist the earthquakes, the events, the tribulations, the difficulties that are coming around us in our day and age. So we're going to continue with our study today in building pillars. This is study number four. So if there are earthquakes, what can we do to, number one, prepare ourselves and number two, try to avoid as much as we can the consequences of the earthquakes. Speaking in terms that relate to the earthquake of Revelation 16, 18 through 19. And of course, if we remember in Revelation uh, 16, we had an earthquake that rocked the whole earth. That's pretty important. But it says it divided the great, th the great city in three pieces. Now, one of the things that I want to point out right away before we get too far into this, the point of this study is not to find um, a shortcut, so to speak, to a safe space that will protect us from everything that's going to happen in our day and age. That's not the purpose of the study. The purpose of the study is to give us the building blocks, the tools that we can prepare ourselves for the work God has ahead of us. And that means being firm and strong in a time of great difficulties. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. You know, when, when we talked in the last uh, study, we talked about the consequences, the effects, both primary and secondary of earthquakes. And of course, we can see in these pictures on this, uh, on this slide, we can see what earthquakes cause. We can see division, we can see the ground opening up, we can see destruction, death, uh, financial burdens, societal burdens, all these things that come because of earthquakes. And of course, this is true in a spiritual sense too in the church when there are earthquakes. And so what we want to do is we want to be best prepared. Uh, like the Shinbashira, the Japanese temples, built in such a way, if there is never an earthquake, wonderful. But should there be an earthquake, it's built in such a way to resist as much as can be the, the consequences of what's happening around. And so it's a forethought of how to live and how to think and how to act that prepares us in such a way so that as the world falls apart, we remain firm and strong. <clears throat> So as we talked about in the last study, we have five primary, uh, five uh, effects that we're talking about, three primary, two secondary. Uh, I'm sure there's many more other effects. These are just the ones that we're focusing on to help us understand the concept. Uh, the three primary effects, of course, earthquakes divide, they split things, they destroy things, they kill things. And the secondary effects, they cause economic costs, they ca cause social and planetary changes. And these are some of the, the, the things that happen that are most recognizable to us. And so let's say that someone told you where you live, there is going to be an earthquake in five years. These are the effects of the earthquake. What would you do to avoid them? Now let's say that that earthquake was gonna be spiritual, not physical. Uh, and it's not to say that there are not more physical earthquakes now, we studied in the last uh, study in this series that there actually are an increase in national dis uh, natural disasters, including earthquakes. But what we're trying to focus on here more than anything is the spiritual, because a natural disaster can even take our lives or damage us or hurt us or take away everything we have, but that doesn't take away our salvation. 
whereas it's the spiritual earthquakes that could actually take away our salvation if we're not prepared. And so when it comes down to the physical, all things physical can be lost and yet salvation can be attained. But if we lose salvation, then there is no point whatsoever in all the physical we have in this world. So if you knew there was going to be a spiritual earthquake, what could you do to help prepare against these primary and secondary effects? And it's kind of what we'd like to look at today as we're going through this study. <clears throat> I have a beautiful picture here. It's one of the places I would love to one day possibly visit. This is Machu Picchu. Uh, I don't know the exact date of its construction, but you know, over around three, four, five thousand years old. No one probably knows exactly when it was built, but it's a very old uh, ruin site. But what you see here is a, a ruin site that, while it's missing roofs and things like that, it's fairly intact. And this is pretty actually cool because it is so old. And we know that there has been a history of earthquakes throughout the Americas, including South America. Uh, just in our own generation, in our own uh, epoch of time, there have been records of many earthquakes. And yet here we have this structure that still stands for the most part. And this is very unique and very interesting. Here are some pictures of close-ups of the walls inside the city of Machu Picchu. And again, we can find this is very interesting because they're standing fairly intact. And this is amazing. Uh, there is no cement, uh, mortar, glue, uh, as far as we know, in between any of these rocks for the walls of Machu Picchu. And this kind of adds a question. If there's nothing holding these rocks together, how do they stand? Now, to me, when I look at this and consider the years of earthquakes that it's withstood, I see in this an example for us in the spiritual. You can see that each one of these rocks is very distinct. They're not all the same. They're not carbon copies, one of another. They're actually very distinct. And it's that distinctness that actually lends to its ability to resist uh, earthquakes. And I think that's important for us to, to learn. I think too often when it comes down to especially like church and religion, we would really like everyone in church to just be a carbon copy of ourselves. And that that's really not a, an ideal in any way. Uh, but we can see that in these structures, there's distinction in every one of these stones. Some are small, some are big, some have multiple uh, faces, some have very few faces. But when you put them all together, they interlock and have strength. And this is the unity that I believe God is looking for in his church. He's not looking for us all to be carbon copies one of another or to walk around like robots. He's looking for us to be distinct. And when we speak of distinction, we're not speaking of uh, we're all kinds of different sinners. No. When we're talking about distinction, we're talking about where our focus is, where our passions are, what our gifts are whether or not our gift is prophecy or history or whether our gift is helping the poor. Uh, each one of us has a different gift. And when we bring all of these gifts together, these abilities, we create a church that is Christ's church. And it has the ability to resist the, the tremors that exist in this world. One of the interesting things here in Machu Picchu is they've got these rock they look like a rock dish almost. Uh, they've got these uh, almost like a dish shape carved out of stone that they put water in. And these are on the ground and the water lays flat. These, these uh, objects have two purposes really. First and foremost, as we can see in the upper right pit images, uh, these objects serve as mirrors. We can see ourselves. And I think when we're thinking about earthquake resistance, it's very important for us to be able to see ourselves as we really are. Without a mirror, we really can't see who we are. We can't really see inside of ourselves. And so the idea being here that we need to examine ourselves, we need to know who we are. But the secondary purpose of this actually for uh, the, the designers of Machu Picchu, probably the primary 
purpose of these objects was actually to see the heavens, to see the heavenly. And I think that's important too, because when we focus on just what's around us in life, sometimes we can get lost. You know, there's a saying about missing the forest because of the trees. And I think that's important to think about because as we're looking at this, sometimes we need to step back and we need to be able to see the world from God's perspective. We need to be able to see the heavens. And so what we have here is objects that at night, because of their stillness, they would reflect the stars in the heavens and they would allow the indigenous people to see the heavenly. And I think that's important in our own life that we can see the stars, that we can see the heavenly, metaphorically speaking, that we can look into the past at the examples, Abraham, Isaac, Lehi, Nephi, the examples, Peter and Paul, of all these wonderful people who have lived before us and left their example for us. These would be the heavenly stars for us that we're looking at and seeing and finding our own way in this world. Uh, and also by seeing the heavenly, we look at God. We look at who he is and what he is and what that means for us. And this is important as we frame our own life in this big picture of God. So as we look at the first of those five elements in uh, what happens when there's a natural disaster, division, we understand that division more than anything is what comes from the work of the devil. Now, this passage we're going to read in Ezekiel 37, I find a very unique passage. Uh, the very first part, uh, if we didn't know it was coming from the Bible, if we didn't know it was coming from the prophets, if we just read it off of a piece of paper, uh, many Christians today would say, this is speaking of the one world government. This is speaking of the Antichrist and what he's going to set up. But that's actually not true. This is actually speaking of God's kingdom. So let's go ahead and read it. Verses 20 through 28. And the sticks whereupon thou writest shall be in thy hand before thine eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and I will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and there shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. I see this as really important because, again, a lot of people on reading this, at first look, think about the one world government, the Antichrist, and, and, and what a lot of people imagine is coming. But as I've told many people, according to scriptures, the devil can only destroy, only God can bring unity. And this is what we're talking about. In order for us to escape and resist the division that an earthquake causes spiritually, we have to be one people. And that's what God's talking about here. He's taking his children from among the heathen, wherever they've been dispersed, and he's bringing them together into their own land. And our own land, of course, is Jesus Christ. Our own land is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's bringing us from all nations, from all peoples together to one belief structure. That is the belief structure and laws of Jesus Christ themselves. We're one nation. We're one nation under God. Uh, it, this is not by race, by color, by genetics, by any of that. It's by belief in what Jesus Christ has set before us. And so there's no longer division. But that division doesn't just disappear. It disappears because we follow the master. We're looking at the heavenly in those mirrors and we're putting that heavenly into our own hearts and soul. We're leaving our detestable things. We're leaving our idols, the things our hands have created. And, and it's not to say that we are abandoning all physical things, refrigerators, uh, whatever, lawnmowers. But what it means is we have ceased and desisted putting the physical before the spiritual. We are understanding that actually the spiritual concepts in this life are more important than everything physical. And that's important. And so then 
we become God's people and he will become our God. Let's continue in verse 24 to 28. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. And so there's going to be one ruler over all. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel with my sanctuary, shall be in the midst of them forevermore. And so, again, we have this concept, Jesus Christ, because David here in verse 24, that is God's servant, who is king over everyone, is the metaphorical representation of Jesus Christ. He is the king of kings, and he comes and he brings unification. Uh, if you remember, in the time of the judges, you just had basically 12 tribes doing their own things with judges watching over them. But then you had David who came in. First there was Saul, and Saul began the unification, but really the tribes did not get unified until David came in. David was the first one to really bring the tribes all together as one nation, and that's the unification that's being spoken of here. That kind of unification needs Jesus Christ today, and that's what we're looking at. So he's bringing us together with one shepherd, and the way this happens isn't just because we choose to come together. It says in verse 24, we walk in his judgments, we observe his statutes to do them. And so it's giving us the groundwork for what it takes to bring us all together. And it talks about us dwelling in the land that he has given to Jacob, his servant. And when we go back and we look at, of course, obviously in the physical, that's talking about Israel in the land of Palestine. But I think there's a deeper sense in all of this because when Jesus came, uh, when God came to Abraham, and when God came to each and every one of his people, even before Abraham, because aside from Abraham, at the same period of Abraham, a story that we don't actually have any of, we have Melchizedek, who is also a priest to the high God. We don't have his story, but we know that God was communicating with many people in those eras, and even before those eras. But the, the land that God gave them where his people would dwell is in the land of righteousness. It's Eden, Eden in a metaphorical sense, where we follow God's commandments, understanding that we can walk out, understanding that there is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if we partake of it, we leave the garden. Essentially saying, when we put the physical first, when we choose to follow the rebellion of our heart, the humanness of ourselves, and decide to set God aside, we leave the garden. When we come back into the land uh, of Israel, so to speak, in the metaphorical land of Jesus Christ, it's because we've decided to set aside our wants and desires and follow him, knowing that our king knows what's best for us. And so when we do that, then the world looks on and sees that we're blessed, we're multiplied, uh, God inspires his people, they're creative, they're artistic, why? Because God is with them. That's what it says in 18, uh, 28. The heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. This is how we really blossom as a people, because we choose to follow God and allow him to give us the intelligence we need to operate in this world that he created. Everything that's in this world, God made. He made genetics. He made DNA. He made the atom. He made it all. He knows how it works and he knows how best for us to use what he has. But we have to acknowledge him and go to him to get the understanding of how to work it all together. And so this is what it's talking about. And so what we have here is basically five points that we're gonna be going over. Number one, we have the two sticks that God brought together, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and the fact that they give witness to each other. And when they are separate, uh, the division still exists. But when we acknowledge Jesus Christ, and most importantly, when we acknowledge the gospel of Jesus Christ, these two sticks come together almost like two magnets being sucked together. 
there's just nothing you can do about it. It doesn't matter if you want to reject one or if you want to reject the other. The fact is, as long as we follow uh, the gospel, these two things come together. Number two, we've got to get out of the heathens. And Babylon is another sense of this. And another way to put this is oftentimes people talk about the American dream. Or in a sense, this would be the Babylonian dream. And the idea is when we say the American dream, what we're thinking about are physical things, the desires of the flesh, uh, cars, money, wealth, prestige, you name it. This is what we want as humans. But God's saying if we want to avoid the effects of the earthquake that's coming, we've got to get out of the heathens. We've got to get out of Babylon. That doesn't mean we necessarily have to move where we live. But what that means is we've got to have a different mentality. We've got to look at things distinctly. Uh, there's a lot of things in this world that maybe aren't necessarily sins or we can't classify them per se as a sin because the scripture doesn't say it. But we know just by their cause and the effects in society, they're not wise. And so we stay away from them. Uh, we don't stay away from them because there's sin and we want to avoid sin. No, we stay away from them because they're not good for us. They don't take us where we want to go. We're getting out of the heathens. The heathens do many things, some very evil, some of them neutral. But even the neutral things they do oftentimes take them where we don't want to go. We want to go to God's kingdom. And therefore, we put things in our life that take us to that destination. Number three, the people of God are united as one. As we're following Jesus Christ, we fall into line. And we will find quickly that all people who follow Jesus Christ soon come together. It's just, it's inevitable. You can't change it. Again, it's like magnets being sucked together. Because when you follow Jesus, you come together. He is the only power, the only force that can unite us. Number four, Christ will be our shepherd, our leader. His laws will be our laws. And this is absolutely vitally important. I mean, we look at it as Christians in a very spiritual, religious way. But this even goes outside of religion. People who begin to accept and stand on absolute truth are brought in closer to us because the laws of God are the laws of nature in this world. And so when we accept the laws of God, we are accepting Jesus Christ in a very simple way and we're being brought in. When we look at the world, they want to reject the laws of nature, the laws of God. We talk about, you know, uh, two genders, male and female. That's what God made in this world. The world wants to reject that. They want to say there's 120 some genders. And of course, we can go over a million different things where the world is trying to reject the laws of God. And we're talking about the natural order of things. I'm not even talking about paying tithing or anything like that. I'm just talking about the natural order of things. And when we accept that natural order of things as God designed it, then Christ becomes our shepherd, our leader, and he directs us towards his ideal will. Number five, the world can see that God is our God and that we are blessed. And so when we're following God, uh, sooner or later, there begins to be maybe on a small scale at first, but a larger and larger scale as time goes on, evidence of who we are. That's the most important thing. The evidence that we are Christ's people is not because of the sign that's over the church door. That's not it. The evidence of who we are is how we live, what we say, what we do, what our life is showing. This is the evidence that the world looks on and even if they never saw the sign over the church door, they would be able to say, these are Christ's people. And that's vitally important. And so this is how we avoid the division that comes with the earthquake. Number one, the two scriptures that come together. We accept the testimonies of the two of them. We prove the testimonies of the two of them. And so rather than looking at either one of these books through the lens of judging the men who were flawed, who wrote them, because we can find flaws in everything that man has ever done. I don't care what book you go to, there are always errors and flaws because we as humans are flawed. But we're not looking at these through the eyes of looking for flaws of men. What we're looking for is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the absolute truth that he set forward for us. And this needs to come together and it needs witnesses. And there are witnesses 
Let's read in Ezekiel 37, verses 16 through 20. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And join them one to another in one stick, and they shall become one in thy hand. And when the people of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and I will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. And the sticks whereupon thou writest shall be in thine hand before thine eyes. And to me, this is really critically important because we do have two sticks. And of course, we know in the time of Ezekiel, when he was writing this in Israel, the most common way to write a book was on a scroll. They would have a stick and either it would have paper rape wrapped on it or it would have uh, animal skin wrapped on it. And on the paper, the animal skin was, you know, the text of the scripture or whatever book you were writing. And so what we have here is we have two sticks, two different writings. One of these writings was written for Judah. One of these writings was written for Joseph. And this is vitally important because in order for these sticks to come together, we have to know what they are. And we have to have this obvious distinction that one focuses on Judah and the people that were around Judah. The other focuses on Joseph and the people around Joseph. And so when we see this, we can measure this. And so it says that these books come together and they become one in our hand. That does not mean they necessarily become a physical one book. What that means is that we read them and we understand the witness that they give on a very basic level. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and Messiah. Okay, There's basic things in here that we're reading and we're discovering and both of these books confirm them 100%. And so when they come together, they become one in our hand because either one of them supports the truth, the facts. And this is important for us. <clears throat> then we continue in 2 Nephi chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. And not to the bringing forth of my word only, saith the Lord, but to the convincing them of my word, which shall have already gone forth among them. Wherefore, the fruit of my loins shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah shall write, and that which shall be written by the fruit of my loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines, the laying down of contentions, and establishing peace among the fruit of my loins, and bring them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days, and also to the knowledge of my covenant, saith the Lord. And out of weakness he shall be made strong in that day, when my work shall commence among all my people, unto the restoring thee, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And so there's many things that are happening here all at once in this passage, that if we latch on to them and incorporate them into our lives, it helps us resist the, the tremors that are happening in this world today in a spiritual and a psychological way. Number one, there are two things that are going to be written. One of these are going to be written, as we've already mentioned, for Judah and those people. The other will be written for Joseph and those people. And we should expect to see these two things coming forward in verse 24 when God begins to restore his people. Of course, we know that the restoration of Israel as a nation happened all the way back into the late 1800s. Uh, and then, you know, specifically we get up to 1948 when they were established officially as a nation. And so between the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there should be out in the world a second book that is about the house of Joseph. And it should be acknowledged in itself to be about the house of Joseph. And when we say the house of Joseph, we're talking about um, Ephraim and Manasseh. On some level, it should refer back to them. And so this is pretty important. It says that these two books, the one that was written for Judah, the one that was written for Joseph, eventually would be able to come together. The purpose of their coming together is that when we search for absolute truths, we will find these absolute truths in both of them. And when we latch on to these absolute truths, they will confound false doctrines, they will lay down contentions, and they will establish peace. But 
If we reject one or the other, we are on weak territory. We know that if we go to the Justice Department and we go before a, a judge with a case, what the judge is going to be looking for more than anything is the weight of witnesses. If I just go and say, look, I am bringing a case against somebody and it's just my word against their word, that's not a very strong case. However, if I come in with strong witnesses and there's, there's actually a method to understanding what a strong witness is. It's not because they say perfectly the exact same words. There's actually distinction in their words. And when you study and understand what a good, what good witnesses mean for uh, the legal system, these two books should look like this. They should look like two witnesses, two distinct stories, but at the core saying the same thing. And when we pick out those absolute truths, therefore the founding of the confounding of false doctrines, laying down of contentions and establishing peace, and also bringing the house of Joseph to a knowledge of their forefathers. And this is pretty important uh, in the whole uh, spectrum of this. So as we bring this together, this is bringing unity and giving us strength against the division that earthquakes want to bring. 3 Nephi chapter 9, verse 98, Therefore it shall come to pass that whosoever will not believe in my word, which am Jesus Christ, which the Father shall cause him to bring forth unto the Gentiles, and shall give unto him power that he shall bring forth, bring them forth unto the Gentiles, it shall be done even as Moses said. They shall be cut off from among my people, which are of the covenant. This is pretty important as we're looking at it because God's telling us if we don't believe his words, if all of this picture that we're laying out here is not coming together for us, then we are going to be separated out. Separated out, not, not necessarily by God kicking us out, so to speak, and giving us the boot. We will be separated out by our own choices because we will be rejecting that which is true before God. And so God is saying the Gentiles are going to be doing something that God has sent them to do. And we should pay attention to all of these events because all of these events are showing us something that plays into these end times events. And so those that don't accept God's words, they will eventually be cut off. They will be outside of the spectrum. And this is important to think about because we don't want to be outside. We're trying to avoid the division caused by the earthquakes, real and spiritual, of this world. And the only way we can do that is to make sure Christ is the rock on which we stand. And so now on to 3 Nephi chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. And these things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people. And I have written them to the intent that they may be brought forth again unto this people from the Gentiles, according to the word which Jesus hath spoken. And when they shall have received this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, and if it shall be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Really important words here. And, and what he's really laying out here is that God is not going to give us more than we can handle. He gives us a little bit and then he tests us and see how we handle that little bit. In, in a very simple way, we can kind of compare this to going to school and learning, learning, say, mathematics, just as an example. When we go into, you know, kindergarten, we're taught our alphabet, we're taught our numbers, you know, one, two, three, four, five, very simple stuff. Then as we graduate and learn that, we're taught simple addition, one plus one is two, etc. And as we grow, eventually we get up to calculus, trigonometry, and harder math. We graduate because we've learned the lesser math. This is exactly what's being described here. You know, as a little child who maybe looks at and understands that there is higher math, we could imagine there's secrets out there that someone's trying to keep from us. That's not it. You've got to learn the basics before you can grow. This is true in the spiritual thing. You know, a lot of people, when they read this passage that God will show us uh, the greater things, they think that there's some secret information out there somehow that God's keeping privy 
uh, keeping you know away from us, and we want to know what those secret things in are. The reality of it is, we have it all in the scriptures. What we may not have is the story of all peoples, nations, and tribes in the world. But when it comes down to the gospel, the building up of Christ's church, we have everything. There is nothing else to be had. And so the idea is that when we learn the basics and we learn them well, then we graduate into the next piece and God gives us greater understanding. And so even though all we have in our hands is the Bible and the Book of Mormon, day by day as we learn from them, our understanding grows and they become more real and more valuable. And it, stand, it just kind of opens up like a flower to us, which is very important. But if we don't accept the Word of God and we don't believe it and we don't grow, well, you know, a child that refuses to learn his numbers can't go on to simple addition or subtraction, can't go on to multiplication and division. This is just the way life is. This is a natural law. Therefore, if we can't understand the basic truths of God and see them and accept them, we can't go on to learn the deeper things that are found in the scriptures. I mean, how many people read the prophets, the Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah's and scratch their head? What does this mean? What is this all about? What's God trying to tell us? Or revelations? What does this all mean? And a lot of people just get stuck there because they haven't learned the basics yet. We've got to learn the basics. That's what gives us strength. If we don't learn the basics, then we begin to imagine uh, what dreams and visions mean. We start to give them our own definitions, our own interpretations, and we go off in wacky ways and we start cults and who knows what with our own ideas and our own doctrines. And we don't stick to the basic plan, the truth of this world that Jesus Christ himself has left for us. And so we need to get out of Babylon. We need to get out of the heathens. And this is actually a pretty serious piece of information. And it's not just coming out of unbelievers, so to speak. I mean, unbelievers are a group of people out there, maybe atheists, whatever. Uh, I'm not saying abandon them, move away from them. But when it says get out of the heathens, it's being very specific. And that is, in this world, there are people that refuse to accept the truths of God. Uh, for instance, we already talked about there being uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, genetics, male and female, and that's it. There are no others. And, of course, you know, the world says, no, you're wrong. There's 120 or who knows what. They, they keep making new ones up every day. Okay, this is what it's talking about. It's talking about the people out there that are teaching and trying to force their ideas, their truths on reality. You cannot change reality. I don't care how hard you try to disbelieve in um, gravity, it will not change gravity. Gravity is still going to be there. Believe all you want, as hard as you want, you cannot change gravity. You cannot change that there are only men and women. That's all God created. And this is true on so many levels. One plus one is two. That's all there is. Believe all you want. You're not going to get, if you add two apples together, any more than two apples. It's just where it's at. And so this is what we're talking about when we say get out of Babylon. It's removing ourselves from those people who outright reject all things good before God. And this is important to think about. Because these people become more and more obvious as we get closer and closer to Christ's second coming. 1 Nephi chapter 7, 50 and 51. For the time speedily cometh that all churches which are built up to get gain, and all they which are built up to get power over the flesh, and they which are built up to become popular in the eyes of the world, and they which seek the lusts of the flesh and the things of the world, and do all manner of iniquity, yea, and find all they which belong to the kingdom of the devil, it is they which need to fear and tremble and quake. And so God's laying out some ideas here for us. The, the world, the heathens, the Babylonians, what they want is the physical things of life, whether it's money, whether it's power, whether it's prestige, whether it's uh, some kind of a control over our flesh, they want these things. God says, these are not what I want. These are not the, the aspects that you will see in the church of Christ. 
quite contrary. These are the opposite of what should exist in the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is not here to get gain, financial gain or prosperity. The Church of Christ does not invest in stocks and bonds and other things in, in a way in which to gain uh, financial prosperity. We're not here to get power uh, over the flesh. We're not here to become popular in the eyes of the world. We are here to hold uh, the truth and maintain the truth. We are the keepers of all things good and right. And this is our job. This is part of what God has set us here to do. But he says these others, those that are part of what we would call the American dream, the Babylonian dream, the heathen dream, they are the ones that belong to the devil because what they want is all things carnal. They do not want all things spiritual. Their perspective's wrong. And when I say American dream, that doesn't mean, as I've already stated, that there's something wrong with lawnmowers or homes or furniture or anything of that nature. That's not it. God's not saying those things are bad. He's not saying life's bad in general. What he's saying is that those people who are anti good. They want to destroy life. They want to destroy the family. They want to destroy all things that God has created. They deny uh, the truths that are inherent in this world. And so he says there should be a distinction between us. Revelations 18.4, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sin and that you re receive not of her plagues. And so the the earthquake that's coming, the plagues that are coming, are specifically focused on this evil. If we are involved in this evil, it's going to affect us just the same as it affects them, whether we want it to or not. So God says, put a distance between you. And a lot of people in the world have trouble with this. We know that as of uh, you know the recording of this video, there are some countries some states that accept homosexuality as normal, accept homosexual marriage as normal, accept aborting children as normal. These are all wrong. These go completely contrary to the truths inherent in God. There are not many different genders. There's just two. And it doesn't matter what people like or dislike. You can't change that. This is basic biology. And so this is what God's saying. We shouldn't partake in this. You know, there are churches today that accept homosexuals uh, as they are. And, and it's not to say that homosexuals can't come to church. The first thing God tells us about coming to church, and this isn't the focus on homosexuals at all, because all sin is sin. The first thing God tells us as we come to church is repentance. We've got to leave behind our sin, whether it's cussing and swearing, whether it's uh, participating in other addictions, our job is to leave behind sin, whatever that sin may be. This is how we come out of Babylon. We reject sin, we leave it behind, we change our life, and we become saints. This is the opposite of sinners. Saints is not to say that we don't have flaws or that we won't trip and stumble, but saints means that we have a destination. We have a plan and a method, and we are fighting to get to where we want to go. Uh, we are actively pursuing a destination, whereas sinners, they're actively pursuing a different destination. And so God wants us to be separate. We don't just accept uh, alcoholics in the church as alcoholics. They come to church, they want to join the church, you've got to repent. The same with all sin. In order to join the church and be a member in good standing, you set aside your sin, you change, whether it's adultery, whether it's fornication, whatever it is that's, that's besetting you, this is what God's talking about, get out of Babylon. Babylon wants to take the sin with it. The heathens want to keep their baggage. God says, no, if you want to be able to withstand the, the, the trials of this life, the earthquakes that are coming, you have to set aside sin. First Nephi chapter 7, verses 56 through 60, And he gathereth his children from the four quarters of the earth, and he numbers his sheep, and they know him. And there shall be how many folds? One fold. How many shepherds? One shepherd. And he shall feed his sheep, and in him they shall find pasture. And because of what? The righteousness of his people, 
Satan hath no power. There's a lot of people today, especially in the religious movements, who say that there is no righteousness, there is no justice. That's not true at all. It, obviously, there is no righteousness of ourselves. We cannot alone be righteous. This is true. But with the Holy Spirit, we can be righteous. And this is what it's calling us to be. It's calling us to be righteous. And God's gathering his children. He's bringing them together. Why? Because they follow Christ. And he numbers his sheep. We don't number them. He numbers his sheep. And we become one fold. Not because we all get under, so to speak, one umbrella, so to speak. But we become one fold because we choose to follow the master, the Messiah. This is important. We follow the one shepherd. And because we're following the one shepherd, we become one fold. This is just a natural, uh, the natural way of things. And so because of this, we are pursuing righteousness. And righteousness is a pursuit in our life. We do not accept sin uh, as a standard in our life. We set aside sin. That doesn't mean that sin won't exist. But when sin exists, we repent of it and we change. This is the course of Christians. Otherwise, we allow Satan to have power in us. Ether chapter 6, verse 6 through 8, And that a new Jerusalem shall, should be built upon this land unto the remnant of the house, unto the remnant of the seed of Joseph, for the which thing there has been a type. For as Joseph brought his father down into the land of Egypt, even so he died there. Wherefore the Lord brought a remnant of the seed of Joseph out of the land of Jerusalem, that he might be merciful unto the seed of Joseph, that they should not that they should perish not, even as he was merciful unto, unto the father of Joseph, that he should perish not. Wherefore the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land, and it shall be a land of their inheritance, and they shall be built up a holy city unto the Lord, like unto the Jerusalem of old. And they shall no more be confounded until the end come when the earth shall pass away. And so again, God is bringing us out of Babylon. He's giving us a new mind, a new focus, a new dream. Our dream is not the Babylonian dream, the American dream, the physical carnal dream. Our dream is the spiritual dream, Christ's dream, his purposes, his plan. And we allow our lives to be molded by him into what he wants us to be. That's how we become the best versions of ourself. And that way we don't perish when the shaking happens. But we're built up a holy city. And when it says a holy city, that doesn't necessarily mean we're all in the same location. But rather, we are all part of, if you think about those walls that I showed you of Machu Picchu, and the distinction in the different stones, some with multiple faces, some with few faces, some big, some small, this is the city God's building us up to be. Each one of us as individuals, each one of us with uh, gifts and, and, and strength in the church that we are using for the building up of God's city. And when we follow his commandments, when we follow his word, then as it says in the last part of eight, they shall no more be confounded. We begin to truly understand the plan of God. It's not just a religion. It's actually a way of life that determines the outcome of everything physical on this planet we live on. And this is important because if it was just a religion, it would just be something we do in a religious way, like many churches. This is not just a religion. This is a way of life. Very important. Number three, the people of God are united as one. And when it says united as one, that doesn't mean like the two books. It doesn't mean they become one book in our hands. It means that they become one in that we're focusing on the good that's in them that gives us the knowledge of the absolute truths of Jesus Christ. This is the same in the church. We become one people, not because we all pile up inside the same house or car or spot of ground in the land, but because we become one people under one shepherd, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 through 6, it says, With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And when it says meekness and lowliness and long suffering, this indicates there's difficulties in life. This indicates tribulations. However, it gives us the way in which to find peace, forbearing one another in love. And so when we have the true love of Jesus Christ, which is charity, it's not the sentiment love. It's not the feeling love. It's a deeper expression of things in which we 
forbear. We put up with the idiosyncrasies of other people. Like each one of those stones in the wall uh, in Machu Picchu, each one was distinct in its own way. It was individual. That's important because we are individual as people. We have different gifts. We have different focuses, but we forbear one another. We don't all think the same. We don't all grow at the same speed. We haven't all achieved the same understanding. That's okay. We can still love each other and grow together. And I love everyone who doesn't understand things as I understand them. And I love everyone who understands so much more than I understand. And I hope to grow. That's, that's the way we need to be thinking. And so in verse 3, it gives us endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so the glue that brings us together is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit directs us to that perfect path of Jesus Christ. And that unity of the Spirit brings us peace. I have understanding that even though there's people who I discuss uh, the gospel with who do not understand things as I understand them, I'm totally at peace. If, they, if I can see they're truly searching for truth, they'll get there. I'm not worried about it. And I also have peace that what I don't understand or what I may misunderstand, God will correct because I know my own heart and I want to find truth. And so this is what I know works in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you want to find absolute truth and you're doing your part in this endeavor, God will bring you there. This is what the Holy Spirit's about. And it gives you that peace to know that as you continue to fight and battle, God will take care of it. For, uh, number four, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. And so again, it defines for us the church. There's one body of people. There's not two or three or four. Oftentimes we want there to be, or we want to confirm that there are many churches out there. But the purpose of confirming many churches isn't necessarily because we believe there are many churches out there that are true and right, but rather by confirming, by affirming other beliefs and other truths as potentially right, it justifies our own errors that we might not be wanting to let go of. And so if I have something in my life that I'm not, I'm not sure is okay by God's standard, but I'm not ready to let go of it myself, by affirming another person or another institution or another group that I know has problems, it puts me in a better light. And then this is what happens in our life. But God says, no, there's one body. We've got to make the effort, the sacrifice to become part of that body that one spirit, one calling. Number, verse five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And when it says this, it's talking about the way in which we believe, the, the structure, the theology, the doctrine, all of that's important and it all comes together under Jesus Christ because he's just one shepherd. He's just one Messiah. He's just one king. He's not going to teach you one path to salvation and me another path to salvation. There's one path to salvation. We all have to fall in line. We don't necessarily like that. And that's the idea behind Babylon because the Babylonian way is every man creates his own truth. And this is what we see in the world today. We see this relativism. You have your truth. I have my truth. Well, that's not true. If we both climb up a tower and jump off, I believe in gravity, so I fall because I believe in gravity, but you do not believe in gravity, so you do not fall because you do not believe in gravity. That's not the way it works. We both fall, okay? And this is the way it is with the gospel of Jesus Christ because there is a way and God has set that way. I don't define the way. The church doesn't define the way. God defines the way. And that's what we're actually reading right here in this passage. Verse 6, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And so through it all is God. He is the, the, what brings it all together in the end. And this is what we're looking for, to put ourselves inside of this plan that God set up for us. When we put ourselves inside of this plan, when we fill out this plan that God's already established, this is how we become the Church of Christ. It's not because of a sign over a building or a sign uh, out front of a building. 
We become the Church of Christ not because we call ourselves the Church of Christ, but because we fulfill, we fill out the words and the meanings of this that we just read in Ephesians 4. Go on to Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 10 through 16. Be kindly affection one to another, with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessities of the saints, given to hospitality, bless us with them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one towards another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own casitas. So what God's doing here is he's giving us the adjectives. He's filling in the meat of what it means to be the church of Christ. Again, it's not, it's not the title. That's not it. The church of Christ is those that are filling in all these qualities, these characteristics. We are kindly affectioned one towards another. We have brotherly love. We prefer one another. We're not slothful in business. We're just, we're righteous. We're fervent in spirit. We're serving God. We're rejoicing in hope. We're patient in tribulation, telling us that there will be uh, tribulation. We even bless the people that persecute us, which isn't an easy thing to do. But that's what God calls us to do. We're of the same mind one towards another. I want the best for you. I hope you want the best for me. This is the struggle that we have sometimes because when we do want the best for another person, we care about them. And so sometimes we reach out to them in our broken ways, in our errant ways. We reach out trying to help people in what we think they need help with. Sometimes we don't do a very good job of it. We're just humans. And that's not to give us a crutch or anything like that, but we are struggling and our greatest desire should be to help one another, to be of the same mind, to love one another and want the best, want not only a good life here in this planet Earth, uh, the life that we have, however long it lasts, but also want the best eternity that is possible for each one of us. Number four, Christ will be our shepherd, our leader. His laws will be our laws. Again, this is part of what fills us out into being the church of Christ. This is what helps us avoid the shaking when the shaking comes. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing that we have a great high priest, a great high priest, not many, not two, not three, not four. We have one great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, find grace in help in the time of need. And so we have a great high priest that is there. He knows our infirmities. Jesus Christ came. He lived on planet earth. He suffered hunger. He suffered pain. He suffered heat. He suffered all the things that we might suffer, uh, the sorrows of loss, the sorrows of whatever it might be. He knows those feelings because he came and he lived. And so we can go to him with confidence, not because we're perfect, but because he loves us and we love him. And when we go to him, he reaches out to us from his throne of grace and we find mercy. But we have to hold to our profession. This is, this is a trial for us. Do we do it or not? We have to pass that trial. And this is the challenge of all of us today because too often, as we've already mentioned, we want our own way, our own religion set up by our own rules. 3 Nephi chapter 12, 19 through 21. Therefore, whatsoever ye shall do, ye shall do in my name. Therefore, ye shall call the church in my name. Ye shall, then ye shall call upon the Father in my name, that he will bless the church for my sake. And how be it my church shall save it shall be called by my name. For if a church be called in Moses' name, then it shall be Moses' church. Or if it be called in the name of a man, then it will be the church of a man. But if it be called in my name, then it is my church, if it so be that you are built upon my gospel. Verily I say unto you, that ye are built upon my gospel. Therefore ye shall call whatever things ye do call in my name. Therefore if you call upon the Father, 
for the church, if it be in my name, the Father will hear you. Again, this is vitally important because God's trying infinitely hard to help us understand the difference between putting a sign in the front of a building that says Church of Christ and therefore recognizing ourselves as the Church of Christ and the act of embodying what it means to be the Church of Christ because that's what the real Church of Christ is. It's not the sign. It's not what we take upon ourselves. It's what we embody. And so the embodiment of the Church of Christ are those people who are built on Christ's gospel. And we've, you know, we've read in Romans, we've read in other passages in Ephesians, what it means to embody the Church of Christ is not a sign. It's what we do. It's what we believe. It's our theology. It's what we practice. And it's not because we, as a church or a people, have established rules and regulations. It's because Christ established the rules and regulations, and we follow him. And that's what it's about. We're built on his gospel, and that's why it's his church, because we do what he tells us to do. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And again, this is just reiterating in another way, the same thing we just got done reading, that if we truly do love God, we're going to follow him. That's what makes us his people. That's what makes us the church of Christ. That's what makes us true Christians. Not because we take on a title, but because we embody what it means to be Christians and the church of Christ. And this is what it means. It means if a man love me, if a man love God, Jesus Christ, he will keep God's word, God, Jesus Christ's words. And therefore the Father and Jesus Christ will love him. This is how, this is how we live. This is how we become the people of God. And this is how we avoid the division and the destruction that comes with the shaking. Number five, the world can see that God is our God and that we are blessed. And so when we think about all that we've gone through so far, there is this embodiment. And in this embodiment of becoming the church of Christ, there are things that become evident to other people. Again, uh, it's not the sign in front of the church. It's who we are, what we do, how we act, how we speak, how we think. All of these things become who we are as the church of Christ. Malachi chapter 3 verses 10 through 12. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, uh, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Again, this is just restating many of the things we've already gone over. The basis behind what is everything that's in this verse is, if we're embodying what it means to be the church of Christ, there should be evidence coming out of us. That doesn't mean, I mean, we've already talked about having to endure trials and tribulations. And so there are trials and tribulations that will come upon planet Earth, and we, even as believers, sometimes have to suffer. We go to the Old Testament, the New Testament, it doesn't really matter. We find in the New Testament, some of the apostles were thrown in prison. They had to suffer hunger, thirst. They had to su suffer depravity, uh, deprivation of sleep. They had to suffer many things, including death. They, none of that was taken away from them. In the Old Testament, the same when there were uh, famines on the land because of God. Oftentimes, believers suffered along with unbelievers. The difference is not in that we suffer or we don't suffer. The difference is that in the middle of suffering, there's a distinction. And that distinction should become obvious, especially to the believer, but it should eventually even become obvious to the unbeliever. There is blessings in having a godly family. There is blessings in treating marriage as God defines marriage. 
And so as we accept these basic truths, even atheists step up to the plate and say, yeah, you know, marriage as defined by God is really the best way out there for society. And I've heard personally atheists say that. They don't accept the Bible, they don't accept the way of God, but they accept the pattern that God's established for marriage as best for society. And so they're beginning to recognize these are the best ways to do it. Now, maybe as believers we're not doing all those things, but if we should be, and if we are doing them, then we are the witnesses towards the blessings that are promised in this passage. If we follow marriage as God designed it, we will be blessed in a way that the world will recognize, even atheists will recognize, that's the best way for society. James chapter 1 verses 22 through 25, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. But if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who beholds his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, and he goes his way, and straight forth forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed indeed. And so again, it's telling us that as we embody what it means to be Christians, we're doers of the, the, the plan of salvation as God has set it forward. Not as a church defines it but as God has set it forward. What is the example Christ gave us? We follow the example. It's just what we do. And it's we don't follow it because we're trying to purchase salvation, because we already know we can't purchase salvation. We follow it because we embody it. It's who we wanna be. We wanna be good people, and that's what it means. And, and, and really, uh, when you think about the churches out there that complain about churches who believe in works, they do have a certain amount of understanding because we cannot work our way to heaven. We cannot purchase entrance by what we do. That's like putting the sign in front of the church that says Church of Christ and thinking that because we have a sign that makes us who we are. That is not the case at all. To be doers of the word is to embody it. This is when works are important. Because, not because we're doing the works to do the works, but because we're embodying what it means to be Christian and Christ-like. And so it's evident in our life that we're doing things. And that's what it's talking about here. Be doers of the word. This is not talking about buying your way to salvation. It's talking about embodying the life of a Christian. And those that do it, these are the people who are blessed indeed. 3rd Nephi chapter 12, 34 and 35, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is my gospel. And ye know the things that ye must do in my church, for the works which ye have seen me do, they shall ye do also. For that which ye have seen me do, even that shall ye do. Therefore, if you do these things, blessed are ye, for ye shall be lifted up at the last day. And so again, it's just, again, repeating everything that we've been looking at up to this point. The idea that we embody uh, everything Christ did. We take it upon ourselves. We become Christ-like through, not on our own, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we do this, that's when we're blessed. This is when we truly become God's people. Uh, we accept absolute truth, uh, and we become the people of God, and the world changes. This is what gives us the strength to endure the day of shaking. And so this is the beginning of understanding what it means to build the Shinbashira, the Japanese temple. Each one of these things that we're going through, in a sense, are the pieces, the tools needed to be able to build a structure that can resist earthquakes. And so I hope we can take these things to heart. I hope we can in embody these things in our own life, not because we want to purchase favor with God, but because it's who we want to be. We, we want to be these people, good people. We want to love our neighbor as ourselves. Uh, it's sometimes a challenge. Absolutely. I, I'll admit it's a challenge for me sometimes, but it really is who I want to be. I don't want to love my neighbor to get some brownie points with God. I want to love my neighbor because I want to love my neighbor. 
because I've already seen through 6,000 years of history, those people who love their neighbors live best. They have the best lives. They have the best uh, cultures. They have the best of everything. And so we want to embody everything Christ gives us because it's the best way to live life. And so I hope this helps you in some way. We're going to be continuing this study in uh, the next part, part five, and looking into more detail of the five different points that uh, earthquakes cause problems. We started with the, the division. Uh, there are three primary points, two secondary points, and we're going to be going through them one by one. And hopefully when we're all done, we'll understand what it takes for us to embody being one of these structures that can resist earthquakes and survive the end days, the days that we're living in. I hope you have a wonderful day and I hope this blesses you. God bless.